And we are from the Way Forward team. And we are here to pump you up. <laughs> the, Way, the, the Way Forward team has been very busy working on the plan to build up our people at St. Andrews. And make them strong. And make them strong, yeah. We are now meeting individually with the members of the council to pump up our ideas and to put them into action. Yay. Last time we showed you some exercises to build up your skills. This time we want to talk about the next idea, volunteering. Yeah, well, Franz, there's always lots to do for our church and our community. For example, the ushers, okay, who gave you the bulletin when you came in, or the broadcast team, who works at the back to make sure that we have a service that's sent out over the internet for those people, our friends who could not come here in person. Or the scripture readers. So today, Franz and I want to set another example of how you can be a volunteer because we want everybody together now because we want to pump you up. <laughs> Today, Hans and I have volunteered to do the church news and announcements. Yes. Our, our first announcement is the birthdays. So on April 4th, we have Chelsea B. And on April 5th, we have Elizabeth S. And next, we have some anniversaries. Mm. April 3rd is Mark and Evelyn B. Also on April 3rd is Judy and Steve H. Congratulations! Both on the same day. That should be a big party, right, Hans? Uh, yes, uh, Hans, but we're not invited. <laughs> oh, that is shadow. Maybe this is a good time for the flood update. Oh, yeah, yeah. A flood update. Who wants to talk about the flood? Very bad. <laughs> Very bad joke. <laughs> Just in line with the rest of it. Danke, Reinhardt. Speaking of floods, a reminder that the former women's washroom is a unisex washroom because the former women's washroom is kaput. <laughs> Another initiative that came out of the way forward is the blessing bags. There is a list of suitable items needed for the blessing bags at the back of the church sanctuary. There is also a bag into which items can be put or your own bag placed. Yeah, this is another way we can volunteer to make a difference to those people we do not know but still need our help. Continuing uh, next Sunday, there is, or next week, there is no Bible study this week or next but we'll resume here at the church on April 17th at 10.30. And on Thursday, April 4th, there will be our Ushra game at the church <laughs> from 1 to 4. Doors open at 12.30. Hans, uh, Ushra? What is this Ushra game? Well, it, it says right here, Ushra, E-U-C-H-R-E, -E, game, <laughs> fundraiser. No, Hans. It's not Usra. Ukan. The CH is hard. Did you go to school or did you go to shul? Is the blue nose a shooter or is it a schooner? Do you follow a schedule okay. or do you follow a sh Oh, that's maybe not a good example. Hans, you are so right. This is very hard. Okay. The Yuka game will be this Thursday from 1 to 4 p.m. Doors open at 12.30. $10 to play and half the money is distributed as prizes. The rest is for the fundraiser. And this is my favorite part. A soup and sandwich lunch is available across the road for $8 at Pete's Kitchen. Or if Franz says it, it's Pete's Kicking. 
Next Saturday and Sunday, April 6th and 7th, there is the Cumberland Lions Club Maple Fest Pancake Breakfast in the Maple Hall from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Cash payment at the door. Children or adults, $12. Children under 10, $8. And the first Cumberland Scouting Troops will have maple products for sale during the breakfast. And, and more food next Super Sunday is next week on, wait, no. April 14th? April 14th after church? Wait, should it be next Sunday? No, Hans, Reverend Stephanie will be away next Sunday. So we will have communion and Super Sunday on April 14th. Okay, okay. Well, um, this morning we give our thanks to Carol P for the God sighting picture that we have today. It shows her amaryllis blooming for Easter. And we also want to thank Reverend Stephanie and Reinhardt and Sue for the lovely flowers at the front of the church. And that is all the announcements I have on the list, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because if Franz and I can do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> and you know what we want? Say, but together, we want to pump you, you up. up. Wunderbar, Franz. Oh, 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 oh,
Mike, you'll join me in our call to worship. Oh, wait, any God sightings this week? With everybody here, there must be a few. Okay, Marilyn. Yeah. It was just beautiful and amazing. Yes, those were lovely services. And they brought us here today to celebrate. Ah, how wonderful. Anyone else? Prayer requests? Are you going to say Colleen? We got to remember Colleen and her friend. Okay. Did everyone hear? Yes? Okay. All right. All right. If you will join me in our call to worship. We gather. We gather to celebrate that no darkness can extinguish light. To remember that love is the irresistible force that makes all things new. To trust that peace transforms and dignifies us and the people around us. God's love triumphs. Our lives have purpose and meaning within the love of God. God's love is our path. If God, who raised Jesus from the dead, is for us, who dare be against us? We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. In the risen Christ, we are restored. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. We are Easter people. All right, our opening hymn is the one you've been waiting for all year, at least I do. It, we are singing Jesus Christ is Risen Today. Please stand as you are able and comfortable. <laughs>
Before I start our opening prayer, I want to say for all of the doubters out there, you need to doubt because that's part of your faith. But on this day, for me, the whole crux of our faith is something that we celebrate, and that is that love triumphs. And it is love that gives us our meaning and our path to follow. And the kind of love that God shows through Christ is amazing and really should inform how you choose to live your life when you leave here today. So when we say things like God's love triumphs, I want to remind you that that is the prayer that goes out into our hands and feet and changes the world around us. So with that in mind and with happy hearts, let us bow our heads in prayer. Holy One, your love is the irresistible force. Your love makes all things new. Your love triumphs. The inexorable walk towards death is a walk into the arms of love. And because of love, our lives have purpose and meaning within your meaning. Because your love includes all and draws all to itself. Your love walked in a human body, walked with intention to the cross, mitigating the root of our human evil, scapegoating or creating an other valuing ourselves more than that other. That is our sin, but that is not yours. Your love is the irresistible force that changes that, that makes us all new and all one in you. Your love created the multiverse and mitigates our deathliness, our death-filled actions, and gives us a new path to walk with you. Your love is our path. Love is the life-filled, rebirthing newness that transforms us. In love, we are renewed, which is to say, in Christ, we are renewed. Hallelujah. Amen. The Candle Liturgy for Easter Sunday. The light the world tried to extinguish cannot be put out. It's Easter morning. We light all the candles celebrating the light that transforms the world. We name ourselves light bearers, changed by the transformation of God's love. As the light returns, we give thanks for God's inbreaking grace at work within us. Today we celebrate new life, new joy, new possibilities. Christ is alive and living amongst us. As we light the candles, we acknowledge that there is still pain and suffering in the world. We recognize that God asks us to help liberate and redeem creation in a way shown by Jesus. In the midst of darkness, there is light. In the face of what appear to us to be overwhelming odds, God is at work in us and in the world, working for justice and peace, compassion and healing. Christ has risen. Whenever we gather in his name, he is here with each of us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Christ is risen indeed.
Our next hymn is Crown Him with Many Crowns. That's Voices United 211. If you want to follow along in the book, please stand as you are able. The first reading is from John 20, verses 1 to 18, the resurrection. Early in the morning on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Madeline came to the tomb and saw that a stone was moved away from the entrance. She ran at once to Simon Peter and the other disciple the one Jesus loved, gasping for breath. They took the master from the tomb. We don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciple left immediately for the tomb. They ran neck and neck. The other disciple got to the tomb first, outrunning Peter. Stooping to look in, he saw that the pieces of linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Simon Peter arrived after him, entered the tomb, observed that the linen cloth lying there and the handkerchief used to cover his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but separate, neatly folded by itself. 
Then the other disciple, the one who had gotten there first, went into the tomb, took one look at the evidence, and believed. No one yet knew from the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. The disciples then went back home. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she knelt to look into the tomb and saw two angels sitting there, dressed in white, one at the head and the other at the foot where Jesus' body had laid. They said to her, Woman, why do you weep? They took my master, she said, and I don't know where they put him. After this, she said, oh, sorry, after she said this, she turned away and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to her, Woman, why do you weep? You are you. Who are you looking for? She, thinking that he was the gardener, said, Sir, if you took him, tell me where you put him so I can care for him. Jesus said, Mary. Turning to face him, she said in Hebrew, Rabboni, meaning teacher. Jesus said, don't cling to me, for I have not ascended to the Father. Go to my brothers and tell them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went, telling the news to the disciples, I saw the Master, and she told them everything he said. The second reading is from Acts 10, verses 34 to 43, the message. Peter fairly exploded with his good news. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. He makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as he says, the door is open. The message he sent to the children of Israel that went through Jesus Christ, everything is being put together again. Well, he's doing it everywhere, among everyone. You know the story of what happened in Judea. It began in Galilee after John preached a total life change. Then Jesus arrived from Nazareth, anointed by God, with the Holy Spirit, ready for action. He went through the country helping people and healing everyone who was beaten down by the devil. He was able to do all of this because God was with him. And we saw it, saw it all. Everything he did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, where they killed him, hung him from a cross. But in three days, God had him alive and out where he could be seen. Not everyone saw him. He wasn't on public display. Witnesses had been carefully handpicked by God before, beforehand. Us. We were the ones there to eat and drink with him after he came back from the dead. He commissioned us to announce this in public, to bear solemn witness that he is, in fact, the one whom God destined as judge of the living and the dead. But we're not alone in this. Our witness that he is the means to forgiveness of sins is backed up by the witness of all the prophets. Let's affirm our faith together. The Affirmation of Faith, Psalm 19, verse 14.
May the words of our mouths and the mediations of our hearts be accepted in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Our response to the scriptures today was written by uh, the Reverend Brian Draper, and uh, it's just beautiful. And so we will do it as a call and response. Lord, as if the shock of Good Friday wasn't enough for your closest followers, we feel for those faithful women who went to visit you just after sunrise on that Sunday morning and fled, trembling and bewildered and afraid. You were not there. Forgive us when we sanitize your death, and forgive us too if we belittle your resurrection. Please help us to see through fresh eyes this most incredible of moments, this greatest twist of any plot on this most joyful of mornings. Help us to see it through the tear-filled eyes of those women. Help us to see it through the disbelieving eyes of the men, some of whom came running. And help us to glimpse it through your own eyes, which must have blinked in the early morning sunrise of that first Easter day from out of complete and utter darkness and refocused and creased with a smile. You are risen indeed. Amen. All right. Our, uh, our next hymn is the Day of Resurrection. That's Voices United 164. Again, please stand as you're able and comfortable. Please be seated. I hope you will all enjoy this. The choir has worked really hard on it, and it is a beautiful, beautiful cantata. And they make it easy for me on Easter because I don't have to write a sermon and you don't have to hear it. But you do have to hear the cantata, and it is gorgeous, so I hope you'll appreciate it.
Through the centuries of time, we observe in scripture and song frequent associations of Jesus with the imagery of the rock. Christ has been called a rock in a weary land, the solid rock, the rock of our salvation, and the cornerstone of our faith, just to name a few such references. These and other similar citations are woven into the fabric of this work for choir and narrators. As Jesus began his earthly ministry, scripture records that he spent 40 days fasting and praying in the wilderness, where he was tempted by Satan to turn stones into bread. Jesus prevailed in this and other challenging encounters and eventually became the chief cornerstone, as the Apostle Paul states, the foundation upon which the household of faith was built. In his death, it was a large stone that was placed over the mouth of the tomb to ensure that his body would not be removed. The theme is prominent and the message is clear as we recount Christ's life of strength and ultimate victory. This cantata, no stone could hold him, is a reminder that the God who created the heavens and earth has dominion over them. We see that the author of life can conquer even the seemingly impenetrable finality of death. That power is fully demonstrated in the resurrection story of Jesus, an immovable stone sealing the tomb and presumably signaling the end of Christ's earthly influence merely becomes an open gateway through which his message penetrates the world. Jesus is truly our living and eternal rock.
Jesus, the Holy Son of God, had been sent to serve and save those who would receive his message of eternal hope. Led by the Spirit of God into the desert, 40 days of prayer and fasting had prepared him for that which was to come. The earthly ministry he would soon begin, a journey destined to be a blend of joys and sorrows. In this wilderness experience, Jesus had remained faithful and had not faltered in the face of Satan's temptations. Jesus began his ministry by calling his disciples. He passionately taught them and others, providing hope and healing to all who would listen. Compelling messages of grace and love inspired people from every walk of life to heed the master's call, turn from their sinful ways, and follow him. He was the way, the truth, and the life. This was the Christ, the living rock on which all persons could take their stand and build their faith in the loving, living God. The growing popularity of Jesus and the expanding presence of devoted followers over the three-year span of his ministry did not go unnoticed by religious and political leaders of the day. There was rising concern among them about this man and what they perceived to be a false portrayal of true faith. Amidst Christ's clarion call for people to turn and follow him, winds of change were beginning to blow. Growing unrest was evolving into evil plots to undermine and end the influence of this teacher, the humble man from Galilee.
Large crowds often gathered around Jesus to simply be near him, to hear his teachings, or to observe his miracles. It was now time for the Jewish Passover, and again, Jesus was surrounded by a large host of devoted followers. As he prepared to enter Jerusalem for the Holy Festival, the people shouted their praise for all they had witnessed through him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel! Defiant religious leaders said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Tell them to silence their voices. But Jesus responded, I tell you this, if they keep quiet, the rocks themselves will cry out in praise. Consensus had been reached. The religious leaders had agreed that crucifixion upon a cross was the appropriate sentence. Having secured the need, needed government approval, Jesus was led to Golgotha, the place of the skull, to be crucified. In a final act of submission, Jesus was nailed to a cross to die a criminal's death. Standing beneath that cross, the faithful few who witnessed his final hours and heard his final words found confirmation deep in their souls that this was indeed the Christ, the precious cornerstone of their faith, now torn from the earth's very foundation. As evening approached, a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph came to bury the body of Jesus. Having received permission from Pilate to do so, he took down the body, wrapped it in a linen cloth and placed it in his new tomb one he had cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a large stone in front of the entrance. Concerned that the followers of Christ might attempt to steal the body and tell others that he had been raised from the dead, Pilate ordered that the tomb be secured by placing a seal upon it, 
with guards stationed there to ensure that nothing would happen. It was now early morning of the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene and some of the other women made their way to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. As they approached the tomb, they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the tomb? Can I get a round of applause for the choir? And Carol, who worked so, so, so hard. On the note of that joyful, joyful music and beautiful words, and thank you, Glenn, for reading those beautiful words so well, I would like to 
join with you in our affirmation of faith. Which is up there. There we go. So we're going to do this a little differently. Usually it's me and you, then me, then you. This time it's everybody, then it's the men and the women. So pay attention, people, because we're doing a little different. Everyone together. We believe in a word that forms on the lips of the creator and echoes in our souls. A word that is love. Men. We believe in a word that breaks the silence of neither and disturbs the noise of ignorance. A word that is love. Women. We believe in a word that brings life out of death and laughter with the morning. A word that is love. Man? We believe in a word that cheers up the darkness, flooding it with light. A word that is love. Women. We believe in a word that speaks to all loneliness with self-giving compassion and care. A word that is love, everyone. We believe in a word that speaks to our futures, calling us by name to trust anew and believe once more in a word called love. That beautiful thing was written by a, a minister in England, in the UK. It's, I just love that. All right, and if you will join me, we will sing together all creatures of our God and King. That's Voices United 217, and we're going to do verses 1, 2, and 5. Please stand as you're able and comfortable. Thanks again, Glenn and Carol and choir. That was, that was just wonderful and lifted my spirits. As we offer our tithes and offerings, remember that this is the message that we send to people. This is the message that is so redemptive and wonderful in our world. So as you give, know that you're giving to go out there and help the people that need to hear that word that is love.
God of the empty tomb. Your grace amazes us, and your generosity fills us up to overflowing. Accept these offerings as a sign of our gratitude and bless our work on your behalf. May we love as you loved. May we serve as you served. Call us forth into your world, guided by your spirit of love. Amen. Please be seated. This beautiful prayer is by Kate Bowler. We followed her last year uh, during Lent, and she is a wonderful writer and professor and theologian. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this beautiful, beautiful prayer as much as I did reading it. Let us pray. Lord, how are we to respond to this day? Anything is possible. We have no frame of reference for this, no logical explanation to make resurrection a normal everyday occurrence, and yet, Suddenly we can see it. Resurrection is everywhere. Your life, your love, and your energy breaks out in surprising ways and unexpected places, even in our own hearts and our own lives. And so we celebrate you, and we open our hearts to you, that you, O King of glory, may come in. That stone has got to be rolled back from the tomb again and again every year. And so we roll up our sleeves. He comes back when it is we who rise for him. We who lay healing hands on the reviled and the rejected, like Jesus did. We who call for righteousness in his insistent and loving voice. He joins us at the table when we remember to share God's love, God's love feast. All are invited, come as you are. And so it is we who must love, who must become part of the energy that restores our world, part of a flow of love that taps into the divine energies flowing in and through us. And treat each other so tenderly, as though just this morning she or he made the personal effort to make it back from heaven or from hell, but certainly from death, to be by our, our side to restore creation as Jesus did. Because if by some miracle, and today of all days, why not a miracle? He did come back. Wouldn't he want to see us in the act of caring and liberating? Wouldn't it be a miracle to live for just one day so that if he did, by some amazing feat, come riding into town, he could look around and say, this is what I meant. And we could say, yeah, it took us a long time, but we finally figured it out. Oh, let us live to make that so. You are the resurrection and the life, and we pray and try to live as you taught us, especially by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Thine is the Glory. Please stand as you're able and comfortable.
we have a budding soprano in the back. Oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> My dad always told me when I was learning to drive that I needed to drive for the people ahead of me and behind me and on either side of me. That was actually really good advice. And I can't help but think that this is what God does too. God goes before us. God shores us up from behind and is on either side of us always. What a relief and what an encouragement on this Easter morning. So go singing with confidence. God is like the world's safest driver. Ahead, behind, and on either side, God walks with us. And when we let God, God informs our very being and our very purpose and infuses everything we do and everything we say. So when I say, Christ is risen, you say, Christ is risen indeed. In we'll try it one more time. Christ, Christ is, is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Walk with confidence and share that joy. And may the grace, mercy, and peace of God go with you always. Amen.